Ben, you guys that want to race hit both agendas essentially because you have a lot of track day opportunities but then you also run a fantastic scholarship to get uh, people of all ages into motor racing. Yeah, so we cover a scholarship initially where um, we welcome drivers uh, to try and win a fully funded season with us. Um, we also operate more premium uh, track days, so um, we welcome drivers uh, on all, all tracks uh, in the UK. We go to Europe, um, and then we run a, a series as well. So through Ginetta, we're obviously Ginetta focused at, at Donington, and we run our own entry-level novice uh, race series as well. So we have a, a product or a service uh, for everyone who, who wants to race, basically, yeah. It's fascinating how you guys have got three completely different dynamics about how you go about it. I'm interested in learning about each of your uh, different endeavors in more detail. Hugo, I know obviously uh, you've come prepared mm -hmm. with a lot of notes. If about, I may. Uh, absolutely, of course you may. That's what we're here for. Tell us a little bit about uh, how the Classic Sports Car Club operates, uh, how it hits its endeavors, and uh, where it's headed for the future. Right, well, um, I've actually prepared something that's a little bit more different on a different, uh, different oh, right. level, if, if I may. Uh, before do. that, uh, I was actually going to talk about a little bit about how I got started. Uh, so, yeah. And I started with the CSCC, so um, if I would just like to say a few words. Yeah. Um, in 2002, the CSCC pioneered the mini endurance type race format, the 40 minute races with compulsory spit spots for one or two drivers on or one or two cars. And with a few exceptions, we continue this format to the present day. We've 10 series of our own, which cover cars from the 1960s up to the present day, with our tagline of motorsport for cars of all ages. I started, like many of you uh, have done, by attending track days with a mate in his car, and finally took the plunge to jointly buy a race car and to go racing as it happens with the CACC. I applied to Motorsport UK, or the MSA as it was then known, got my medical and turned up here at Silverstone. Uh, other circuits are available. I passed my ARDS test, all of which you will have to do, before obtaining your National B race license. One of the greatest hurdles to getting started in motorsport is the cost. Uh, we bought an ex-Silverstone race school Peugeot 309 GTI, which as it had a cage in it, meant we, had ex we only spent £110 preparing it to go racing. This consisted of adding a fire extinguisher system and a cutoff switch. We had no trailer or any money for one, uh, or a tow car, so we drove the car to the circuits. The car was purchased for £1,250 and sold a year later for £1,450. I learned a huge amount in that first year and as a result of various technical issues it took me 11 races to get rid of my novice cross. However, we had enormous fun and did everything just about as cheaply as it was possible to do at that time. We worked out that including all the costs, fuel, insurance, accommodation, etc., at the end of the first year it had cost us £9 a minute to go racing for the season. Now, I won't pretend that those costs have not increased dramatically since then. We set out to do a season's racing on all the British iconic circuits with very little money. Gaining my National A licence led to me being able to race at Spa and the Nord, uh, Nürburgring Nordschleife and taking part in the Birkett Relay races. I was living the dream. Doing things with a mate shared all the lows and the highs and together we overcame anything that the racing threw at us. You may be starting out as a hobby, or with the intention of a career in racing. But I suppose I'm saying that racing still doesn't have to cost a fortune if you're resourceful. There is no substitute for seat time, which is where the CSCC is such a good value. Spend your money on a car with all the right safety equipment, but not on an all-singing, all-dancing grenade of a motor that may not finish a race. There's nothing more demoralizing than having an expensive motor expire, as it will have cost you a lot of money and effort to get to that point. As you're starting out, you need a safe and reliable car above all else, so you can concentrate on learning your racecraft and getting to know the circuits and how a race meeting functions. I taught myself to go faster by following other drivers on the basis that if they can get round that corner at that speed, on that line, then so can I. However, with the benefit of hindsight, instead, if you can afford it, do get tuition from a good coach. It's the best pound per pound investment you can make. Lastly, remember the marshals. Most of the people in the UK in club racing are volunteers. They stand out in all weathers so that you can go racing. Make sure you show your appreciation to them on the slowing down lap by giving them a wave. Never underestimate just how much they like to be appreciated. 
Very true. Thank you very much, Hugo. I actually think we should give a round of applause to the marshals. They're actually oh, behind well. us. Well done. They are actually behind us. Without oh, them, marshals. you couldn't go racing at all. So a massive thank you uh, to them. And that's a very good point you make, Hugo. Yes, without them, we couldn't race at all. So thank no. you for that. It's fascinating to hear you know, just how you can go from nothing to full competitive motor racing. It's always really fantastic to hear those stories. And you've got some brilliant ones in there. You know, selling a car for a 200 pound profit, it's not bad going, mate. That's pretty good. And it good. was smoking. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't have to tell us that. Time to move it on. Yeah, absolutely. Quick, sell it. Uh, no, it's fine. Um, Stuart, I'm really intrigued by how you get so many different people who come in literally with no track day experience at all. They come in with their car and think, well, I can drive it pretty quick around the M25, so clearly I'll be able to hash it around Brands Hatch, no problem. It must be really fascinating to see how drivers will come in with one idea and then they find out very quickly through the track days that you run just how intensive and how disciplined you have to be to get things right. Um, it, it's a very interesting point. Ev everyone has the ability to, to drive a car. Um, everyone can, can go out and drive a car um, on, on the roads. The, the, the difficulty with the road test, it teaches you how to pass the test, it doesn't teach you how to drive the car. A lot of the, um, the, the strengths and the weaknesses of your individual driving ability gets learned over the first few months and years of, of you being out on the open road. You, you have the freedom to, to kind of make the mistakes and, and learn for yourself. It's not so much the case when you're on the circuit. The, the racing is is very strict and stringent. There are rules, there are regulations. You have to be in the right place at the right time. And, um, and you rely on clubs such as CSCC or, or MSC to, to help you learn what you need to do in those instances. It's very important that in that area, you are um, helped along that road. Um, in track days, we, we learn very quickly whether your on-track ability is natural or whether your on-track ability has to be learned. And just because you can drive a car you know, with, with relative ease or relative comfort on the road does not mean that you can transfer that skill onto being a competitive or even a capable circuit driver. So it is very important that you take your time, you build the, uh, you build the pace of the car, you build the pace of yourself, and you actually learn the circuits that you go to. And variety um, is, is really key to that. You may be able to go to one circuit and drive that very well, but if that's the only circuit you've ever been to, instantly thinking that because you can drive around brands a, a minute flat does not mean that, you know, transferably, you could drive around the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit at an equal pace. Um, so it, it's an ever-learning forward motion, um, and, and people do take to that at their own individual pace. You still see cars, drivers that are very capable at certain circuits and need work at others. Um, the, the key point for MSVT is that when you see us in your racing form with Track Day Trophy or Track Day Championship or even the Enduro Car or uh, Super Cup Series that we've got here today, um, it's really important that whenever you need help, you can go and you can ask and you can get the help. And we're in a really good and unique position to be able to take you to a wide variety of circuits with a massive array of instructors with differing skill sets and differing um, abilities at, at different levels with a wealth of experience and kind of really pinpoint what the drivers need, who can get that for them and then where they need to go to, to move forward. So it's, it's quite unique. Everyone's journey is individual. Everyone's ability is individual and being able to give them a worthwhile experience and a worthwhile training program is, is something that is key to, to their enjoyment of the sport. It's, it's one of the areas of the sport I'm always fascinated in. I think I might end up, you know, my, the extent of my motor racing career is probably going to be spent purely in test days and track days. I'm not sure anyone would ever put me out on a racetrack. So it is something that really fascinates me. And from, from your company's side, Ben, with Want to Race, I mean, some of the case studies that you guys have seen with drivers coming through who have basically been, you know, sort of amateur drivers or club drivers who want to go and do professional racing for a year, to have gone through the scholarship program and to emerge as professional drivers at the end of it after a season. I mean, it must be really fascinating to be part of those drivers' journey as they make their step into the professional scene. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, we love it. That's why we, we do what we do. We meet thousands of, of drivers each year um, of all ranges of experiences. Um, as Stuart says, um, 
it's, it's a difficult path to start on and um, yeah, getting involved with a, uh, in your own car on a track day and then thinking that you, you might want to race is um, quite a daunting thing. So um, yeah, we, we will, uh, well, we love uh, helping dr uh, develop drivers, um, giving a great experience and setting people off on their journey. Uh, fortunately, we have found some uh, extremely good talent, um, which you would do out of a few thousand drivers every year. Wow. And uh, yeah, we, we win, uh, we see our drivers win championships, win series every year uh, that we, you know, that we're involved with them. So we're, we're really good at nurturing, helping, uh, developing drivers and, and just having a lot of fun along the way. Here's an awkward question. We've got the testing going on around the circuit at the moment. How many of you have actually done a competitive on the limit lap around this particular circuit? The international one. Hugo, you must have done a lap or two. I have never done, the international. You've never done the international. I've done the Grand Prix. Oh, I've, done done the, I've done Stowe. I've done the, uh, the national, but I've never done the international. So I've done three only ever run four. meetings here. The, the, the day is still young. If you dash downstairs, you might get your first <laughs> yeah, lap in. Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll see. Stuff. We'll see. <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, Stuart, is this one of the ones you've done? The international circuit here is much like Hugo, one of the circuits that I've not actually driven. I've done, it's done the national. That, isn't it? The, the new and the old Grand Prix circuits, but, but never, the, uh, never the international. Ben, could you at least give us some insight? No. No? <laughs> You've got three track day experts, and none of them have done the international circuit yet. I'd love to have a race with these guys, though. I mean, I, I'm, oh, if yeah. there's a challenge on today, then we'll, we'll do it. But, um, well, yeah, there's some competitive cars in CCC. <laughs> I'm sure there's a few seats going spare. Come on, Hugo. Yeah. Let's yeah, yeah, yeah. cars. Um, no, I'm, I'm the same as these guys. I've done ev every single Every uh, other configuration of Silverstone. We're racing at Donington one. on Monday, yeah. so we'll have a go at each yeah. other there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's definitely unfinished business with the international circuit. Um, let's talk about 2020. As we move forward into a new decade, obviously there's always going to be innovation and changes in the world of motor racing. At various different levels, we're seeing changes. Motorsport UK has rebranded over the last 18 months and are trying to make steps for progression. I think it's very critical we talk about that from each of your perspectives because that's how we get new talent into the sport. Uh, your endeavours are going to bring the next Andy Prios, the next Jason Platos, the next Lewis Hamiltons through to motor racing. Uh, what do you see as being the key elements for how Motorsport UK makes things easier to bring new talent in? Stuart, can I ask you that question? Um. The what would you like to see happen? <laughs> um, I, 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 diplomatically, um, I, I think the... I always ask the awkward question. The, the, the best way to assess whether, um, as, as an organising body or as a championship or as a series, you're doing a good enough job of encouraging new people is to look at the figures. Um, and, and I'm sure that the, the spreadsheets have been meticulously gone over um, in relation to not, not just um, what's going on with the, the new license um, holders, but also the existing license holders. Um, and I, I would actually like to see more consultation with the clubs at uh, club level to, uh, to discuss um, what, what their thoughts and feelings are. I mean, we're on the coal face, we're talking to the new drivers. Um, in the instance of, uh, of ourselves, we're putting the new drivers through their ARDS tests. We see them straight away. We know their thoughts, we know their fears, we know their feelings um, about that. And um, what, what we've done um, when we uh, approach track day trophy specifically, enduro car specifically, we, um, we have to look at the barriers that there are to going racing. Um, and some of them are perception and some of them are factual. The problem that you've got is when you're on the outside of the, uh, the club looking in, um, you don't know what's fact, you don't know what your perception is. And it's really important that both the, the factual elements of, of where the barriers are to stopping people going to, into motorsport um, and, and, and where their perceptions of those barriers are as well. I mean, we, we have the conversation quite regularly Football is so popular in the UK because anyone can go to Asda, spend five pound, buy a football and go to the park. It's obviously not achievable with motorsport to do that. You can't go to Asda, spend five pounds and buy a motor, uh, motor <laughs> racing, racing car. Yeah. So um, you, you can't do that anymore? No, no, no <laughs> sorry. Sorry to break that. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, but there are ways that we can make that journey easier. Um, and I think it's, it's responsible um, of 
all of us, uh, including the governing body, to ensure that as we're going forwards into the new era, into the new decade, um, that we do that in a responsible um, and productive manner. Things are changing. Things are changing globally um, as well. Motorsport in the next 30, 40 years may not look like the motorsport that we see today. And it's important that the transition period there is as seamless as possible. Um, and that would be what I would suggest um, that, that is looked at. It is not just how many people you can sell a license to, but how seamless you can make the transition into motorsport. Ben, ben what are your thoughts on that one? I like, uh, personally, I like what Motorsport UK are trying to do. Um, they're, they're looking at the, uh, the wider picture, welcoming as, as many people in as they can. Um, a crucial thing for them um, and us is uh, looking at uh, things like memberships. So whether you are just a track day customer, just an enthusiast, or indeed you do want to go and race, um, you can get a membership with Motorsport UK, with Want to Race, with MSV, and, and uh, all these organizations and feel part of something um, really special. Um, and yeah, w once they're in, I, I totally agree. I think we need to do a better job of keeping the license holders there. Um, I think there's a, while we get the new, new blood in, we've got to um, make sure that there's a, um, a comfortable progression for, uh, for drivers, both time-wise, budget-wise, and series-wise. Um, and there's no drop, drop off the other end, because there's no point just bringing a load, a, load, a load of new drivers in, and then you have drop off at the other end. Um, I think Mot Motorsport UK are, are you know, trying to grow the, uh, grow the interest and grow the, the license numbers um, you know, nationally. And um, yeah, I think they're doing a good job. Sounds good. Hugo, what do you feel? Um, I think the, the Motorsport UK, there's something that they can definitely do which would help us. Because if you're going to go racing in this country and you're starting out in a racing, you're going to go with a club. It's the only way you're going to be able to do it. Uh, those clubs are the people that have to put on uh, an event where you can turn up, you can go, you're safe, and you'll be able to race around a circuit knowing it's safe in the knowledge that whatever, whatever may happen, you're going to be looked after. The creep, I'd say creeping, it's starting to become quicker. Uh, electrification, if I may call it, of our cars um, is going to decrease the relevance of the combustion engine over the, few, the next few years. And if you're going to get new people into the sport, we're going to have to be able to provide that safety for young people coming in, dare I say it, in either hybrid or electric cars. As things stand at the moment, the barriers that have been put up by Motorsport UK with regards to the safety equipment that is used um, are pretty high. And for a club to be able to cope with that and be able to pay for it, someone like Formula E or whatever will have their own safety equipment, their own marshals, they've got the whole thing covered. Um, we don't. And they are moving towards training towards electrification for marshals. But I think that's something that needs to be stepped up it, uh, another step. And I think it's very important that if we're going to remain relevant and motorsport's going to carry on into the future, um, that needs to be done. That's a very interesting point. I love the fact that you uh, picked up on the fact that, you know, most of the young drivers who go up to the top have to start in club racing. I think it's often they negated that uh, the Formula One drivers, the Le Mans 24 hour racers, the Formula E competitors, none of them would be where they are without these grassroots, these track days, these club racing championships. I mean, it's worth n noting, uh, I was there in uh, Alton Park 2013 when a young lad stepped into a Citroen 2CV to get signatures on his racing license. And now he currently races for the Williams Formula One team, George Russell. So there you go. Without the clubbies, you can't go to Formula One. It's as yeah. simple as that. That's a fabulous little story. And I, I, it's interesting, the relevance, because I, I've commentated in some way in each of your endeavors in varying ways. I've had dealings with Motorsport Vision at various circuits, classic sports cars. I've been in the commentary box at a wet Donington Park and Silverstone many times. and seen the Ginetta Juniors and Seniors in their Winter Cups and whatever. And it always intrigues me that there is such a plethora. I've seen some of the greatest races I've ever seen at club level. Some of the most incredible stories that one day I will write an amazing book about. But Ben, I seem to find it frustrating because so many of these races don't seem to get the credence uh, and the respect 
that they deserve. And there are so many drivers who are unsung because there's no credit. A lot of that, I think, from my point of view, comes down to the fact that we are so engaged in the television, the live streaming, the coverage. There's not enough bums on seats at racetracks. We've got these fantastic grandstands around the circuits. And for a lot of the races that you guys enjoy, they're, ba they're barely full. So what do we do to combat that? How do we, well, to, how do need, we fight the war? You need to speak to Stuart and sort the uh, <laughs> ticket, ticket prices out for the, on the gate. Um, Surely it can't just be as simple as dropping ticket prices. There's no, be more to I, it I don't that. think it is. I mean, everyone's on social media. A lot of things are streamed. Um, but yeah, the, these club, club races, you know, and um, the lower level series, like the Janetta uh, GRDC, for example, the, the cars are identical. You know, you've got a full grid of 30 cars. They're absolutely identical. Um, and what's that going to bring? It's going to bring really, really, really close, exciting racing. And um, we have in the UK a, a, a massive passion for motorsport, and that brings a huge pool of um, very talented drivers, which unfortunately, um, you know, because of the costs and the, the prohibitions there, they won't ever get as far as Formula One. But we do ourselves with Janetta and uh, these guys sat next to me, there's always a, a ladder and there's always a great uh, progression as you get more experienced and as you get, move through your, um, whether it's a hobby or your career and you, you move up up the ladder and find, you know, find a comfortable, um, enjoyable platform where you feel safe and um, welcomed and you, know, you, you, you enjoy the people uh, that you're spending the weekends with. I know for a fact, Hugo, that some of the CSC C races that I've seen at Mallory and Silverstone have been way more fascinating than some of the Formula One races at the start of the year. Mm. Why is it that there's still this unheard of in many respects? You know, why, why is it so unsung? Why, why well, can't we get people on? Possibly we don't shout about it enough. Possibly. Okay. Uh, but then again, uh, as you say, nowadays there are so many more pressures on people's time and what they can do. We, we were at Donington last weekend, we ran night races, we live streamed it. Um, it was a big success, a lot of people watched it and a lot of people enjoyed it. Yeah. However, that comes, at, as always, at a big cost. Yeah. Uh, and it's not the sort of thing that a club can afford to do all the time. So again, you've got to be resourceful and try and come to places like these, let people know about you. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, we've, we've lost, uh, we've just lost Autosport. Uh, that's uh, for whatever reason, which is one of the places where a lot of people would read about club motorsport. Um, and uh, I think, yes, you're right. We, we do need to maybe shout about what we do a bit more. Um, the general person on the street probably has no idea that club racing actually happens. And I believe this is where the Motorsport UK are moving ahead now to bring that on to make people more aware of it. Um, as you say, I mean, we, we have the odd touring car driver. We had Andrew Jordan driving with us at the weekend. Uh, he was co-driving with another guy, Danny Kassar, who was up there with him. He's a club racer. He's not professional. He comes out and races with us. As you say, there are, there are a lot of talented people out there. Uh, and if they've got the money to produce a car that's powerful and it can stay the, stay the distance, uh, they are successful. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the secret is to letting people know about it. There's, uh, there's only so much the club can do. I suppose it's, it's an awkward thing because there, there are so many different people's vested interests. I mean, yeah. one of the things, the way I describe it, Stuart, is that you know, every driver, no matter what they're in, when they've got that red light on at the starting gantry, whether they're in a Formula One car or a supercar or a Golf GTI or a racing lawnmower, that experience is exactly the same until the lights go out. Every driver feels the same way. Yeah. So should there be more of a focus, do you think, to put things on an equal footing, to give more credits, to give more credit to these people doing what they're doing? Yes. <laughs> Short and sweet. <laughs> how, how do we do it? How do we do it? What, what, the, what's the point? I, I think the, the important thing to, to bear in mind is to, to understand where club racing sits in the hierarchy. Um, I, I go back to the football analogy. Um, I went to see my local team play football um, in the week. Um, Herne Bay, there was about 250 people there. And that was for a, uh, a league game. You, know, you compare that to a premiership game where there will be tens of thousands of people there. Club motorsport sits in the same sort of area. Um, we, we have to, to be realistic with the number of people that will come along and have an interest in their local circuit or their, their local 
uh, championship in the same way that you know, they would have an interest in their local football team. Yes, there is a certain amount of responsibility that falls with the club or the championship or the series to create their own superstars. And all of us do have the ability to do that if we take away the time pressures. The, the problem that we have is that in, in a, an ever-growing um, club-level motorsport circle, which is very competitive, trying to spend time in the right areas is really important to try and make sure that the clubs are prosperous and that, that the circuits are, are running and, and that the, uh, the drivers that are with you are having an enjoyable time. Trying to create the next star within your championship or series does fall slightly lower in the, um, in, in the totem pole of, of things that the, the clubs and the series need to do. It, it's difficult. You know, it all comes down to, uh, to finances at the end of the day. And if, if we have the time and if we have the money to be able to promote the, um, the sport with the live streaming um, that is, is coming into force now and with the driver interviews, that sort of thing will become easier to achieve. Um, right now, in the, the market that we see, where, where people are just starting to spend money again, um, it, it's difficult to, to try and allocate enough time to do that, to do it successfully. There's a fascinating case study that has always baffled and delighted me, and it's uh, a place that I think, if I say it, every single one of you is going to grin from ear to ear, and it's Castle Coombe. Hmm. Because uh, Castle Coombe, you see, there's a giggle straight away, because we just all love Castle Coombe as a circuit, and I don't know how they do it, but they genuinely bring Tom, Dick, Harry, Uncle Ted, Auntie Alice, everybody comes to the racetrack. And I don't know if you've ever been to an event at Castle Coombe, go during one of their bank holiday meetings, because it genuinely is like stepping into 1973, when you have the stands and the banks absolutely packed with people. I don't know what they're doing, what their case study, we, we, I, I want to investigate a little more detail, because that's the blueprint for, in my opinion, what every racetrack should be doing. I think they're just engaging more with the, the local, um you know, they've found that uh, connection with the, yeah. all the local license holders, drivers, and um, geographically maybe it's something to do with it. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wicked old track. We ran our, one of our track days there two months ago, and it was one of the best, best days of the year. It was uh, old school, really exciting, fast, bumpy. Very bumpy. Scary yeah. circuit. <laughs> um, and the, yeah, places like Castle Coombe, um, they're independent, you know, MSV obviously own a, a number of the tracks and it's, it's really good to see uh, a track like Castle Coombe having a, a good go at it and getting that, that uh, following and those, those entries. They're, they're really well, uh, all the series there are, are well entered, uh, their own championships. It's an interesting dynamic. You brought up about uh, how MSV has now five major race circuits and obviously the testing bed at Bedford. So there's some incredible circuits within the MSV calendar. The, the most pinnacle names, you know, there's Brands Hatch there, Snetterton, Cadwell Park, you know, the mini Nürburgring. Donington's Donington, the best. Donington, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I wonder why you would say Donington as well. I wonder why. That's where they're based. Um, there's some amazing circuits and so much history in them. I mean, I guess the challenge from MSV and MSVT's point of view is to really tap into that history. And, you know, when you're on those track days at that circuit, you're part of something quite special. Yeah, that, that's correct. I mean, the, the, the depth and breadth of circuits that we have and the experiences that you can get at these circuits in the UK um, is far, you know, far wider than just the MSV um, group. But when you look at the, the history that has um, you know, come, to, come to pass at Silverstone, for example, Donington, Brands, as uh, Formula One venues, you know, we, we can talk to our clientele and, uh, and you can explain to them, you know, you may not be old enough in the case of brands to, uh, to remember when these Formula One icons have raced around this circuit, but you can race around the circuit, which is almost unchanged from the, uh, from the, the Formula One glory days. And as an experience, as a piece of history, that is you know, phenomenal. It's a phenomenal experience to, uh, to go. And the, the one thing that I would say is that if anyone listening today or, or watching back says that they haven't experienced the Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit, find a, find a provider, find an operator, find a club, yeah. race it, do a track day on it. it. It is phenomenal. And when you put that into context of the 
Formula One machinery that would have been racing around on, you know, on that circuit back in 85, 86. Um, it, you really get a taste of what it was like back in that era of Formula One in a way that you can't really do anywhere else. It's on my bucket list. I've done the Indy. I haven't done the Grand Prix yet. Um, while we're talking about circuits, Hugo, I, I imagine that with the drivers within the CSCC, the right circuit on the right weekend, that can make or break a season for a lot of people. It, it makes it so special. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we would like, there are all sorts of things we'd like to do, but you have to work within constraints. In the pecking order, when we're looking at our dates, we're pretty low down as the club. We have to start with the Formula One, then you've got super bikes, uh, British super bikes, then you've got the touring cars, and we're sort of down the bottom. So that's why we've only just been able to put our calendar out. Uh, as you say, strange old world. We ran at Donington Park. We had our biggest last weekend in the pouring rain, cold, Okay, it was night races, but we had the biggest turnout of the whole year. Who would have thought? Um, if you'd done the same meeting uh, earlier on in the year, maybe you wouldn't have had quite so much out. So it is different, and certain, certainly different circuits uh, have different effects. Um, we're, we're slightly unique, if I just want to push this for us. Um, we do take all our, 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 our customers to Spa every year. Uh, and I know it's not a UK circuit, but it is in the same way an iconic circuit and it's something that people aspire to and if you're any sort of a racer you want to race at Brands Hatch on the Grand Prix circuit every time we go to you with the Grand Prix circuit and you let us come and race with us we're jam-packed mm. that was the last race I did was at the Grand Prix Sand circuit I, <laughs> I would put that up there as one of the best circuits I've ever driven on absolutely superb and um, yeah I would, uh, it is very important and you can only go to there are only so many racing circuits last year we lost Rockingham there are only so many places you, you can go to, and you just move them around. Um, and we do try, and we've always tried to support the independence of Red. I know, you know, Motorsport Vision has got a, a monopoly there, but there are a lot of other race circuits that need our support. Castle Coombe, for instance, they're going to be support, uh, uh, um, celebrating, I think it's the 75th anniversary Easy, this yes. year. So, uh, again, a big year for them. So, we won't be able to go there because they haven't got room for us. So, uh, yeah, maybe next year. But uh, yes, definitely. Uh, I think you know, most of the circuits around in the UK come with a huge amount of history. And most people, most drivers, sit on the racetrack. They sit at that ready for the start. And you think, wow, I'm here. I'm at Donington. I'm at Silverstone, where they go on the Grand Prix. You get them out on the Grand Prix circuit, sitting on that grid. It's a high. It, it really is. It's what you do it for. You guys both have experience of Spa with the things that you've done as well. So I, I, I imagine, you know, going to different places, that can obviously you know, be an amazing special part of the quality of the service that you guys provide as well. Yeah, for me, uh, Spa is special. I've, I've raced there a number of times and fortunately done, done quite well there. And on the business side, we've, yeah, we run, um, again, race series and track days over there. So uh, we were there in July with, um, with one of our track days, which was a, a sellout event and yeah, absolutely fantastic day um, everybody loves the day at Spa you know you can't not <laughs> no, just love being fantastic. there the track the uh, environment um, uh, nice steaks good steak and wine <laughs> it is um, the motorsport <laughs> booze cruise it is, yeah. isn't it? It, that's, that's what we go for we, we love the circuit we love the experience it's a good it's a good trip and, it, and it's iconic you know Eau Rouge everybody uh, who has a, a whiff of petrol in them knows Eau Rouge and to, to go up there flat out yourself is um, yeah, it just gets the adrenaline does, going, does and um, that's why, that's like Hugo says, that's, that's why we do it. That's why we organize events. That's why we run series and um, drivers and welcome people in mm. just so they can experience, experience that, that. that buzz, and that, yeah. that's why we do it, yeah. Okay, let's go for something a little bit out there. All three of you are petrol heads. You are addicted to the sport you do. You love being involved in racing. If you guys could hold a test day, track day, club racing day, as it, it's relevant to all three of you, pick a circuit you've not done. Where yeah. would you go? Stuart, where would you go? What's on your bucket list? Does it have to be UK? Not at all. You oh, can go right. further afield if you want. Right. This oh, is a fantasy, yeah. so budget is not taken into consideration. I, I'm probably going to say Laguna Seca then. <sighs> There's a few people that are nodding. Yeah. <laughs> 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 what, what, what makes it so special for you? 
And it, it's one of those circuits that growing up was um, always in the forefront. When you're playing the racing games, it was always on the racing games. When, when you're looking at uh, you know, uh, amazing videos of crashes and overtakes going through the corkscrew, um, and the, the level of GT racing that they've got there, it's just, it, it's the right mix of inspiring events and um, an exciting circuit. And, uh, and yeah, th that, that would be the one that, that I would aspire to. Go on, Hugo. Where do you want to take the Classic Sports Car Club if money's no object? Well, unfortunately, well, fortunately, there, there is one which I've always wanted to do. And w amazingly, we're actually going there this year. Oh, really? And we're going to Le Mans. No way. Yeah, brilliant. So it's the Bugatti circuit. They've, not, they've refused to close the Mulsanne straight for us. But we're going to go there. And, and I think I very much want to take part. I can't race with our, with our guys. I'm not allowed to. But I might be able to race with some of them. And I hope that I can. Uh, but for our guys, we do mini endurance racing. Uh, it, it's not endurance racing, it's not 90 minutes, but it's a, it's a pit stop race. Yeah. And for our guys who do their pit stops religiously at all the various circuits in the Royal Fair, to be in Le Mans, doing your pit stop in Give that kite, and then setting off down the straight, wow. Yeah. And I'm, I very much hope I'm going to be able to race there, and I hope the dream will come true. So. I, that's what I would say. I agree. As far as I'm concerned, Le Mans is the capital city of motorsport worldwide. I adore it. Uh, ben, what's on your bucket list? Bathurst, I think. I think Ooh, oh, yes. Oh, now one. we've gone up a gear. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'll uh, ring Lawrence Tomlinson after this and see if we can get 10 containers of Ginesta out of Bathurst. <laughs> yeah. 40 helicopters. Can I come <laughs> too? <laughs> <laughs> let's, get a, let's, let's get a full grid and go out there. No, I, I just, uh, I think it's one of those iconic tracks. Um, I've been fortunate to race on a, a lot of the iconic circuits in Europe, so I'd, that's why I'd go a bit further afield. And um, yeah, the, the, uh, the circuit there just, just looks nuts. So it looks uh, really, really exciting combination of some uh, the undulation and the walls and um, yeah. the, the, yeah. the speed yeah. and the, the hill. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. That's the um, Motorsport Days uh, Track Day Tour sorted out for 2020. We've <laughs> three of the best circuits in the world. Um, we've got a few minutes. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask our panel? If you do, that's fantastic. If not, I have one, which is absolutely fine. Anyone raise your hand if you have a question. They're all so riveted, you see. They're distracted yeah. by the rugby, that's the thing. I do have one more question to finish us off then. Um, and you touched on it a little bit, Stuart, and it's the world of gaming. Now, I think we have to kind of accept now, 10 years ago, gaming was still gaming. Now it's a legitimate form of motor racing in four countries worldwide. And now it's a genuine business opportunity and racing drivers are actually going racing from playing video games in their rooms. How do we embrace that culture and get them off the games console into the race circuit. Stuart, I guess you've got a fairly straightforward task in a way because the track day, the test day, it's the obvious starting point. Is there a nice correlation there to be had? The, 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 main, the, the main issue that you're going to have from getting the average um, gamer into motorsport, it's the same as breaking down the barrier for, for when we were discussing Motorsport UK. Um, are they going to have the budget? Are they going to have the time? Um, being able to set up a gaming rig in, you know, in, in your house or in a garage or you know, with, with your friends is, is very different to, to going through the licensing process. And I think uh, there's a certain amount of education, um, a certain amount of crossover, and trying to bring um, gaming events out to the circuits as well um, could have a good crossover. There are areas there, um, but it's not as clean cut as, um, as it may seem. Hugo, what are your thoughts on this one? We have actually looked at this. Oh, OK. Uh, um, and we've talked about it, and we looked at how we can go down. Now, I think I'm right in saying, I don't know if they're still doing it. Was it Nis the Nissan Academy? Uh, Did, it, it's now known as the world's fastest gamer. Well, is that what it's called? It's okay. not through Nissan anymore, but oh, it, it is there. It is say. there. So the people who are going to go out, they can go and race, and they can win a race, win a championship yes. online, and then they get the right to go and play, actually yeah. race. And then they go out and do some iconic racing. And when they, the Nissan were doing it at the time, they actually came and did And they have to get their signatures like anybody else, and they need race time, and they need to go get signatures. So we hosted quite a few of the people when they were doing that. Um, I actually attended a, a, a seminar a few years back, and there was a company that was looking at, um, that they needed investment, and they, 
the investment wasn't there at the time, and I don't know if this is something that they could move on forward to. And what they were going to do was put a car, uh, a van on the edge of a circuit, and each of the car, whether it was Formula One or it could be a, a club racing, whatever, each of the car would have a transponder in it. And in that transponder, they would live feed that transponder in real time, in a game, throughout the world. And people could then actually, for one sort of way I put it, be in live time racing against Louis Hamilton on the track in exactly the same way it's actually in place. Now, I don't know what happened to it, but whether it actually was going to take off, but the, 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 the costs involved of it were minuscule. It was something like a, each person paid a penny. But as you say, the, the, the market is so big, it is definitely something that if we could get in some way involved with it, it's definitely something that would, would, would help because if you're reaching billions. Yeah. Final word, Ben. What are your thoughts on this? Well, we're trying to uh, embrace the, the sim, um, sim drivers, sim racers a little bit already with our business. So through the scholarship, you can actually do your stage one um, uh, with the end goal of winning a fully funded season. But your, your stage one is to participate in a, in a sim session, so a gaming session. Um, and then through our group of companies, we, we also have a, our sim track business sat at, um, at Janetta at Leeds as well. So um, we're already on with the, you know, embracing this sort of digital and driver development uh, sim simulator. Um, and we can't, we can't ignore it. I think uh, there are uh, thousands, if not millions of uh, uh, racers <laughs> in their bedrooms or yeah, set up in at China, home uh, globally. Um, and esports obviously is 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 big up and coming. Um, the the barriers are there, of course. It's really difficult to, to get someone out of their their home environment where they're set up racing people across the world uh, to a club or to a track and in a car. But I'm sure with uh, with time, then yeah, we'll all, all be trying to to do that and welcome as as many people as we can. Well, irritatingly, our 45 minutes are up. I could go for another 45 minutes. I'm so fascinated about this subject. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your thoughts. It's been really interesting to hear what you have to say on the subjects. Uh, thank you to Hugo Holder, Stuart Garland, and Ben Highland. Thank you very much indeed. Our next session is coming up very shortly. Uh, do stick around. Uh, there is plenty more to talk about, plenty more people to meet and to learn from. So uh, please do stick around and try not to get too distracted by what's happening in a green field on the other side of the world. Thank you very much.